Great, uh, we are live. Hello everyone. I'll give you maybe a couple of minutes to join. Okay. Great, uh, let's get started. So, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, Didomi webinar. I'm Romain Gauthier, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Didomi, and uh, I'll be your host today. As you can imagine, I'm pretty excited about today's discussion as uh, we have the privilege to welcome two pre prestigious uh, privacy professionals with uh, Marie Fenner and Max Schrems. Uh, so, uh, maybe as a, as a first, uh, to get us started, Marie, could you uh, briefly introduce yourself and also Piano, uh, the company that uh, is also supporting this webinar, uh, please? Of course, thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Thank you for having me today. I am Senior VP of Analytics within Piano. Uh, Piano, for some of you may know as as AT Internet, we've been going on in analytics industry for more than two decades now, and I have fond memories of um, you know back in the days when it was wild wild west. I remember even doing a, like a IP full IP access to IP and then doing an IP lookup and things like that. I mean now it's unthinkable, and we're living in a different world, but hopefully better one. That's me. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Marie. So, Max, I'm not sure you really need a, an introduction. Uh, when I prepared this webinar, I asked uh, ChatGPT about the most famous people in privacy. And I must say you came second <laughs> after uh, Luis uh, Brandeis, uh, who is the author of uh, The Right to Privacy in 1890. Uh, so very famous uh, for other reasons. I would probably put uh, it on first, but anyways. <laughs> you, you may end up first at some point in, in history, uh, but like maybe uh, instead of uh, intro like introducing you, uh, what maybe tell us what, what you're up to these days and what is still like driving you uh, after all these years uh, on the on the scene. <laughs> Yeah, um, basically, um, we do privacy enforcement now, GDPR um, enforcement. The organization is called NOIP, um, this logo in the back. Um, we're 20 people now based in Vienna, European organization, however, with people from all over Europe. And the whole plan is to basically give the GDPR also some teeth because so far um, it produces a lot of paper, but not always that much privacy after all, especially for the ones that really, um, you know, are deliberately not true, like, where there's deliberate violation of the law. That's basically what we're looking to. Um, and um, that's still a pool that is quite big despite five years of the law. <laughs> Indeed, thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, so maybe uh, before we get started, it's a discussion. Uh, it's intended to be, to be open. And so while we, you'll see, we, we have th some themes that we've, uh, we've selected for this uh, discussion. We'd really like uh, to discuss together today, and that includes you in the audience. So please feel free to send us your questions. There is a question tab uh, on the right-hand side that you can uh, go to and uh, send us questions. We'll try as much as possible to, uh, to answer them and to provide you with a uh, with an answer, uh, but uh, in any case, we also uh, will try to save some time at the end to to go through these questions and bring up any topics of interest uh, in the audience. Uh, so thanks all for your contribution. Um, let's uh, let's maybe before we, we, we jump right into uh, the these core themes, uh, kind of a warm up questions uh, on what I call the privacy spectrum. Uh, so in the privacy spectrum, th there appears to be kind of two incompatible sides with people on one hand who think that uh, collecting more data and more personal data will yield to a better internet for everyone, in particular in terms of uh, experience, uh, and in general to better technologies. So I decided that more data uh, yields to a better future. Uh, and on the other hand, you have people who think that uh, less is more in terms of data and that you could... Uh, you should only seek to collect data that is directly useful and to uh, uh, to be very cautious uh, with, with, with data. Uh, so maybe like as, as a web of question, where do you position yourselves in this privacy spectrum? Uh, maybe Marie first and, and, and then Max. Uh, sure. Um, 
oh, where do we position ourselves? I think, I mean, we went through the big data, as you as you rightly say, you know, collect everything, hoover up everything. You know, there were technologies hoovering everything on your web page, mobile apps, even including pass passwords. We've seen some security breaches and things. From there, now we're talking about data minimization. I don't think we need to be sort of that polarized. I think right thing for us um, is to, you know, it's mainly quality over quantity. Um, and I would say right sizing the data, right sizing by that, I mean, collect what is necessary, what is essential for your business, so that you can measure your baseline KPIs, you need that to, to be able to make right decisions, it doesn't have to go all the way to perhaps one to one retargeting, but simply just to run your your, your, your business successfully, you need a, a minimum, a minimum level of data, which is anonymized and pseudonymized. So I think that right sizing, is, is, is very important. And we do see in the market, you know, that polarization where one camp is um, in a way resisting to the change and staying with uh, potentially even a, a tools that are not GDPR compliant. And, and to go, go around that problem, they're sort of minimizing the data, just collecting only just almost non-existent data, which means you are losing 30, 40, 50, 60, even 60, 70% of the sort of visibility on your side. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's the way to do because you just need that essential data to run the data, to run your business. Another camp is that, you know, since this, you know, GDPR was enacted back in 2018 and now all the you know, national DPAs are really cracking down. So we came to realize that we really need to find a, a, an alternative a safe environment where your brand is protected, but at the same time being able to collect that minimum um, essential data um, that you you know you, you need to run your business. So there there have been companies who've been evaluating different uh, software packages and made a brave jump from you know moving away from legacy and potentially non GDPR compliant solutions and moving to the new solutions and by create by doing so creating additional competitive advantage as well. So I think it's right sizing that knowing and understanding when you need what you need to run your business the baseline KPIs and collect that data in a safe environment and combine that with a you know once the people consent you can collect uh, more information that you can activate. So that, that's, you know, I wouldn't put myself in the middle of that cursor, but right sizing is uh, what I would say. Thanks a lot. Max, uh, do you think the, the privacy spectrum is, uh, is polarized uh, as I presented it? Or do you think that uh, it's also going in the right direction? So the, <laughs> the, the cursor um, is, is going right in the right direction? Uh, I would say good questions are provocative and maybe a bit simplified and I wouldn't see, I would also not see like the cursor basically. Um, in your question, you, you used the word useful and that's not the, the parameter of the law. The parameter of the law is necessary. Um, and I'm usually on these lists where even though people may not believe that we take a very academic approach, usually we just look at the law and what it says. And that is, in in my view, the democratic view of the majority. I mean, we had 90% of the European Parliament agreeing on that. So I guess in, we, I may disagree or agree with certain parts of it, but the test right now is necessary. Um, and that is partly a very tough test that really means, do you really need that? Um, but necessary can also mean a lot of data in specific situations. Um, typical thing, I don't know, fraud, um, CCTV cameras, whatever. There are certain uh, situations where, you know, necessary is huge quantities of data. And in other areas, necessary for, I don't know, a login is one token. That's it. <laughs> and, and that, I think, um, then, then makes the our work relevant of, of, like, you know, applying these abstract concepts like necessary to the specific situation. And that is partly where I still see a lot of, of, of need to kind of dig a little bit deeper sometimes because um, it's it's also a, I mean, we deal with that less than probably everybody else in this room, is an interesting exchange between the technical side and the legal side, what is really necessary, what is really just an extra. And I think what, what Marie mentioned before was really interesting is um, also thinking about what is optional, what can I do with an opt-in solution where people that really want that um, may opt in. And um, we had certain conversations with with um, people, for example, also in the in the online tracking and, and online advertisement business or statistics, where I can tell you for ourselves, we usually don't, we do the minimum that's possible, but we generally still know where people come from. So even if we lose 50%, because on a 
privacy NGO website, everybody has every blocker installed that you can possibly think of. So we don't even know, like we couldn't even technically um, be able to, to find out where people come from, uh, but we can statistically, you know, extrapolate where they come from, for example. And that is for our need as an NGO uh, sufficient. And I think that is also a question that um, we may have sometimes that, um, for example, with an opt-in, you may not capture everybody, but you can capture enough to make the decisions that you need to make, for example. Um, and I think that's that's kind of the um, options you have if you want to go beyond what's strictly necessary is that um, you have to explain to people why you want that, why that's useful, why the product may get better or not, and give them a yes or no option. Um, in, in very simple terms, I usually say you can give up your fundamental right to life if you jump off a bridge. So you can also give your fundament of your fundamental uh, right to, to privacy if you click a consent button. Uh, but people then have to understand what they do and if it's useful for them or not. Or probably in a less dramatic way, you can give up your right to property if you donate money to someone. And um, that's your free choice if you think it's a good cause. <laughs> It's it's uh, it's provocative, like to compare consent to suicide. <laughs> but uh... yeah, I do that mainly because people criticize consent a lot. So they say yeah. we should do the, do away with consent and we should just have the government regulate all of that. But that is fundamentally fundamentally illiberal as well. I mean, if I can literally jump off a bridge, then I guess I can give up my right to privacy. And then I think the discussion to be had is how the um, how the interface looks like, how the ex exchange goes so that people really know what they're doing, which I guess, especially in this bubble, is, is um, a big enough task anyways that we all know. <laughs> it, it is indeed. Thanks a lot. I think that's a, that's a great way to start. Uh, obviously, I think that there are lots of expectations on, on the first topic. I see that uh, like first questions that emerge there on I would say your specialty, <laughs> Max, which are international data transfer. So you've been central in the, in the recent evolutions on the international data transfers, especially between the EU and the US. But I would also say that I think what you did is trigger, has triggered a global movement on sovereignty around data. Uh, but for anyone in the industry, international data transfers is like the the professional equivalent of a Netflix show with always many seasons. <laughs> uh, so I won't spoil the whole uh, show. So two questions for you, Max. First, a question about what seemed to be framed as the villains in this uh, international data transfer show. Uh, US cloud providers, uh, namely Google, AWS, and Azure. So my first question is, is it credible to push for a shutdown of all EU US data transfers when the three of them represent two thirds of the market, so uh, how much of a disruption would that uh, would that create in in the market? Is that is that even feasible? So uh, I'm not sure our society still holds if uh, if you like sh shut down these services. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, again, that's a bit of a, um, there's not just these extreme positions. And um, I mean, in other words, we shut down, I think, almost all the gas that came from Russia over half a year. So that may have been even a bigger exercise than um, than some of the digital things. Um, long story short, um, what's really um, interesting is, I think, in the long run, I'm not a big fan of the, of the idea of data sovereignty in the sense of like, data localization as the main as the main aim um that's not our aim that's that's not anything i i sign up to i'm personally more of a globalist um i think the the discussion we need to have is about lawful access and how the laws in different countries operate and the underlying problem we have is a, a clash of jurisdiction simply uh it used to be that no one regulated the internet so everybody did whatever they wanted to do and now we move into a world where all the governments regulate it, but they regulate in different directions. So as a company, you will simply have to violate one or the other laws. And that's typically the problem with the US where the US simply has very vast surveillance laws. Um, and interestingly, we agree with the US on, on how far surveillance should go online. Um, we have the same rules actually. Um, in the US under the fourth amendment, you also need uh, probable cause and a judge that signs off on, on the wiretap. What we disagree on is actually that the U.S. says, oh, these rights are only to, for U.S. citizens and everybody else doesn't have any rights, so we can surveil them as much as we want to. Um, while also saying, you know, please give us the data because we're partners and we love each other. And that's a bit hard to square at the same time. So I think what we need in the, in the long run is not to shut down everybody, but what we need is um, a 
they call it a no spy agreement or something among democratic countries where we do not kind of spy on each other's digital infrastructure or data by just saying, oh, it's another a company from another country or a citizen from another country, so I can do whatever I want to do as a government, but that we find a way that the Western democratic, however you want to call it, countries can exchange data and trust each other. We're not going to be able to get that done with Russia or China or North Korea anytime soon, uh, but it would be interesting among the um, among the democratic countries in the world. And I think that is what we need in, in the medium term, talking about 20 years or so. Um, and it's going to be a business necessity because otherwise you go crazy if you have to comply with all these rules all over the place. Um, so I think that that is what we see here. Um, what is an option in the meantime is that a lot of these big tech companies are already de facto hosting in Europe for latency reasons, for all the other reasons, technical reasons. Um, what would be the one missing link right here? The cheapest way to fix the whole problem would be that the Americans just em employ 20 lawyer, uh, 20 judges that do proper oversight, but they are absolutely against having these 20 judges. And so we have to deal with all the shit that comes out of it. The easy, the second cheapest option would be that the big tech companies find a localized version, uh, which you already do de facto, like most of the data is, is, is de facto hosted here. I know there is exemptions. I know there are situations where it simply has to be international and there are derivations for that under Article 49 of the GDPR. But if you're the average company that just wants to use, I don't know, Microsoft 365, that could be doable. And that could be an option that in the meantime, they would simply host in Europe once there is no access from the US anymore. And that last bit is what they're not doing right now. They say, oh, it's hosted in Europe, but we still have full access from the US. And that means that under the current law in the US, they would still have to provide all that data. But that's actually a rather small step compared to um, the question of like two thirds of the internet basically being shut down. It's more like, can we get the typically security 24 hour um, thing shut down where right now they typically say they do 12 hours in the US, 12 hours in Europe. Once they would shift to 24 hours in both ends, you would need that extra staff and you could do it. Um, and what I hear is that there is generally a tendency towards that. Um, but so far, there was the lack of enforcement. There was the lack of consumers or customers in Europe simply leaving the products. So, so far, the CEOs of the big tech companies said, you know, nice that the court of justice said that, but no one follows up with it anyway. So what the fuck? And so that is, gets me to the last point that I would like to make. Um, this becomes gradually a bit of a question of the rule of law and democracy as well. Because if we have the Supreme Court of the European Union saying something twice, and again, we may agree or disagree, um, but in a rule of law based system, it would be expectable that people follow that. And it's very interesting because the a lot of the infrastructure that we built, um, Maria talked about, uh, Maria talked about um, latency systems. It's a bit like situations where there's like a big fattest favela where anybody did whatever they wanted to do. And now the government writes in and says, actually, all of this is not built according to code. And actually, this is an environmental protection area, and actually. And that would mean that you would basically have to bulldoze all of that. And obviously, the resistance is, is enormous. But gradually, we'll have to get all of that somehow back on track. And, and that's, I think, also a bit of a long-term process. Um, unfortunately, um, I think the legislator thought we passed the GDPR and everybody's going to be compliant because there's two years transition period where everybody slept in reality. Um, and now we're gradually five, seven, eight years later, 10 years later, we're still working on, on, on getting things that direction. So that's a bit my view on all of that. Um, when, when I listen to you, like the, the, you, you seem fairly like optimistic that the old drama is, is uh, approaching the end. Uh, like, no, not really. Do you really. say that? Right? Or do you think we, are, we, are, we are going to have like uh, many other episodes. Uh, yeah, um, I think the reality is uh, we need um, we need U.S. industry to 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 realize that it's not a long term proposition to say give us all the data to the U.S. But once your data is in the U.S., foreigners have no rights whatsoever. That's simply business wise not going to be a proposition that will last long term. Um, that's a bit like, I usually say it's like Switzerland um, saying, give us all your gold, but actually once the gold is in Switzerland, you don't have property rights. I don't think anybody's interested in Swiss banks anymore. Then. <laughs> and that's a bit the proposition the US is putting out there. And, and I think that's fair enough to point out to say, okay, if you want to you know, strive internationally, you also have to give your international customers some baseline guarantees. Um, politically, this will only happen in the US if the US industry gets behind that. And to have that happen, there would need to be proper enforcement, proper consequences, which are not existent right now. Um, so that is a bit my theory of change that 
it seems we need three or four or five renditions, we're going to get there. Um, because I don't think the Court of Justice is going to let go. I think the Court of Justice will probably even bite more uh, because it's going to be a matter of the power of the court as well. If they tell the European Commission twice, don't do it, and then, then, do, then they do it a third time, it's a bit like the kid, you know, if you tell the kid three times, don't do it, and it does it the third time, at some point, every mom gets a bit excited about the situation. And, and I think that's a bit the situation we're going to see in the political spectrum of that. Um, unfortunately, we have to kind of do this back and forth because we couldn't get a political solution that lasted um, and just rather have the Band-Aid fixing, which I'm personally, like we do 90% other stuff than data transfers. And to be honest, I'm a bit sick and tired of it as well. Uh, but it, it's also hard to kind of just say, okay, let's just pass it as, until everybody else is, is, is bored enough to not take care of it anymore. I wonder, Max, I, because do you think I'm, I'm a glass half full person? I'm, I'm very you know, cautiously optimistic. Um, and we see landscape changing even in the states, within the states. As we, we, you know, we started with the CCPA, now we, we have HIPAA. I mean, there are companies that are being fined for actually not handling the health insurance information, um, healthcare information um, carefully. So do you think we are going to reach that stage even in the states? As a result, um, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take for US to reach that GDPR um, sort of level and everybody waking up and even having a federal um, legislation rather mm -hmm. than state by state. Um, so there's two things to separate here. Uh, the one part is government surveillance. Uh, for government surveillance, um, so let's let's do, do, do kind of corporate surveillance, if you want to call that, or corporate data processing as one thing. That is not a problem. We can opt in and basically if there's a vacuum, we can work with the SECs, we can work with contractual arrangements that a company that is in a vacuum Kind of lifts their level up to European level and thereby has free free trade works absolutely fine. Which is also the reason why in the Schrems two litigation we absolutely uh, defended the SECs and say said they should stay, even though the Irish DPC said the SEC should die. So we actually were in this whole litigation very much the middle ground. Interestingly, uh, between the DPC being all out there and Facebook on the other end, um, which was also the reason where probably the Court of Justice followed literally all our points 100%. Um, the, um, that's kind of the, the, that part of the, where my biggest fear is that the 50 states in the U.S. are going to start passing 50 different laws and we're going to have a huge mess there. That can be saved, so, uh, solved somehow. The problem is in the government surveillance part is that you have an opposite requirement. You have the requirement to not do that. So you would have to walk back the law in the U.S. And that is politically very complicated because first of all, they cannot even pass their budget sometimes. So changing surveillance laws is actually <laughs> politically not easy. Um, and that's also what everybody. Um, I was just told that uh, there's a problem with my connection. Uh, we, uh, we can we, hear you now. Oh, <laughs> we've lost. We lost Max. Uh, Maybe like in, in the meantime, Marie, as, as a professional, you, you're also constantly facing organizations who have to adapt to this uh, fast moving environment. Uh, I see also a question for like rather like medium, mid sized company or small companies being like uh, 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 like a victim of death by, uh, by uh, compliance. Uh, what measures can organizations take to, to ensure uh, compliance uh, with respect to EU and US uh, data transfers. Uh, what, what, what's your experience there? Sure. I, I really liked, um, you know, Max saying um, globalism, but with the localization. Um, I, I was last year, I was at IBC conference in Amsterdam. And that's happening this, this, this week as well. Um, there was a huge debate about EU cloud sovereignty. You know, the e European companies talking about, can we create that uh, excellence, cloud excellence in Europe, just relying on European you know, cloud technologies? I think we're I wouldn't say we're behind, but European tech, you know, cloud technology started a little bit later than those big tech Euro, uh, Euro, uh, American companies. So there's a little bit of catching up to do, but I'd, I'm seeing good progress there. So hopefully we'll reach that sort of, not localization per se, but having a, a strong uh, platform you know, in, within, within Europe. But so strategic measures wise, I think first... The best is not to transfer um, because of the sort of surveillance law and things we you know legal redress and i'm sure max you, you're going to talk about that later on but um if you can 
just retain it. As Max said, there are many technologies, even including piano. We are hosting everything. All the data here in Europe, data doesn't leave. And, you know, there are other, you know, reputable, um, uh, you know, software companies who are providing that, exactly that. Um, and you can even keep the data in, 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 um, in the European, um, in, in, in the cloud here in Europe under a lock and key, you know, you encrypt the data. So data doesn't leave without you knowing about it. I think that's, that's the, if you can achieve that, that's the, I think the first, first thing to do. Um, second thing I can think of is, you know, make sure that your, you know, partners, your vendors, your software vendors um, give you that, you know, the um, technological and technological and organizational measures that they are, they've assessed their own capabilities, how the data is handled, where is it stored, and all that guarantees, as well as, contractual engagement and sometimes um, you know some software companies may not go as far as actually putting that in the contract and making sure that uh, sort of responsibility and accountability are shared yes we are in that data uh, a controller and data processor relationship but i think it's very much a partnership where we have to share the responsibility we have to build the trust between two parties so i think that that sort of uh, you know technical organizational measures and contractual engagement um you need to as a, as a brand you need to make sure that your your you know te technology partners are willing to do that and abiding by that and perhaps last point is you know if you are transferring whether you're transferring or not you need to do the risk assessment and proper auditing process and um without that even now we know certain data um is being you know we're, we're talking about eu and us data transfer but there's a data transfer happening outside that as well to uh, countries where we don't have the adequacy agreement so I think as a brand, it's very important that you assess that, make sure risk assessment is done, and there is a contractual engagement with your software vendors. Make sure that you know all the data is, if it is leaving to go to the US, there is a proper you know corporate binding binding corporate rules in place, etc. So these kind of due diligence, I think, is very important. Thank you, Maya. I very much agree that uh, I think uh, there, there is also a lack of, of leadership sometimes among companies, tech providers and brands on, on these topics. Uh, Max, you were cut, so maybe we'll give you some, uh, some time to, to, to finish your... Uh, your I thoughts. think I was pretty much finished. I, I would wa want to add one thing on, on uh, what was just said. Um, I think one part where we also have to look a bit closer is, or actually two things. Uh, one thing is I think what's sometimes underestimated is how much overhead all of this takes in the sense of I'm oftentimes wondering how there's 10,000 euros paid to an external law firm to come up with some paper that everything is legal because we then save 500 euros on server fees. <laughs> and, um, so uh, to a certain extent, I sometimes wonder if just efficiency wise, um, some of that um, compliance overhead is not really you know, taken into account that much. So I can tell you for ourselves, we host everything in Europe. So my Schrems 2 compliance took exactly one minute um, and, 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 and that was it. Um, so I think that's that's one part. The other part that um, I think also needs to be stressed is we're still in a bubble where a lot of that is done as paper compliance only. So we looked into the transfer impact assessments of Facebook and and, and Google. And um, literally, I mean, the Google one is on our website. You can read it for yourself. And I don't think most lawyers have ever read it. They just said, oh, there's 30 pages. And to say it's fine, stamp, goodbye. Um, I was actually in a conversation at, uh, I think, the IPP, like this um, American um, lobby organization for privacy of professionals. Um, and literally in one of the first reactions, one of their um, forethinkers said, you know, we, are, we, haven't, we haven't ever read the SECs. We just stamped them and put them in a drawer. And now we actually have to read them, you know. And, and that is, I think, also in this area, um, which was, I mean, to me, quite an interesting, you know, public statement. Um, but in that area, we still have to really look behind the scene a little bit. Um, and the best example is with Google, for example, they have, I think, 30 pages of, of their measures and they're all laughable. Like there is, yes, our data is encrypted with standard encryption at rest. That's exactly what the same encryption that my phone has. But if you have to pin, obviously, <laughs> that doesn't help you. Or my favorite one is that they said they have a fence around their data center and a sign saying, do not enter. I don't know if that impresses the NSA in any way, <laughs> but that is literally, you know, they just have pages and pages of that stuff. And, and I'm not kidding, that's not even the, the most awkward things that were in these papers. That's literally with what they fill pages. Um, and obviously, sometimes that would need a bit of a closer look. 
especially because the industry lobbied for that in the GDPR negotiations. The uh, wording was uh, regulated self-regulation. And for example, in Austria, you needed to get a stamp for each international data transfer. So the authority had to authorize that. And the industry didn't want that anymore. They wanted to have self-regulation, be in charge of everything themselves. And, and then, you know, we're going to comply and we're going to do all of that ourselves. Interestingly, now, when you have to do the assessment of US surveillance laws, which is really not easy, it took me two years to figure out how this works, um, people feel a bit left alone, obviously. And I think we're, we're having a bit of a... Um, yeah, sometimes like, you know, we don't go really very deep in these in these reviews, it seems sometimes. Yeah, as, as a solution provider, I, I can't uh, disagree to that. I think that's the organization's number one mistake, which is to, to give the task to lawyers uh, rather than <laughs> transforming to the to do the right thing. Uh, but yeah, that's a very, very large topic. And, and I think, I Marie, think... it's the same for, for Piano, Actually, I think, I to your, your, your doers. Yeah, I mean, Roma, I picked up because when you said, you know, leadership, but we need to, you know, have a stronger leadership in, in all of that. I, I do, again, as I said, I'm a, a glass half full gal. Um, I do see um, not in all organizations, but most organizations we talk to, they have a DPO within their organization and we bring our DPO and our clients DPO together. And like even this afternoon, we're having that conversation with a, one of the European um, retailer, retailers um, about this is what is strictly necessary in our opinion for your business mm. and this is within the realm of the privacy directive and you are in a, it's safe low risk um, and you can collect this data and then we were not debating discussing what do what more do we need but we said it's not more about what more we need it's about why you think xyz is really necessary for you and if you can convince um not just us but convince the world that if you, you need that i think that's that's you know we're having that sort of a now deep conversation as to leadership and dpos are realizing that okay we need to understand the legal framework and how we interpret that and what is strictly necessary it's very subjective not subjective but it's per business if you are running a e e retail business a e e-commerce business you will want to know how you are you, you, you know how much revenue you're generating for example but it doesn't have to be marie marie has spent a uh, hundred pounds in buying a a pair of trousers um, it can be we sold you know a pair of trousers at a hundred pounds and that's one of the most popular products uh, sold today. Now, it, it, it's you know we, we're starting that sort of conversation. So I, I see a lot more maturity in the market, and I, I, we, we we're really enjoying it. But before we move on to that, I was going to in your previous slide, Roma, because there's a Schrems three. Um, what's happening with it? Are we because you know we, we had a safe safe harbor. You know we were just before our uh, conference, uh, Roma and Max, and we were sort of chatting. You know back in 1990, oh, sorry, to, um, 2015, safe harbor um, got uh, invalidated. Thanks uh, um, to, to Max. Thank you very much. And after that, very swiftly we had um, a privacy shield, and then it got invalidated again to 2020. And now we have a DPF data privacy framework. For me thrice. So where are we, um, Max, um, with, with that? We, it was enacted back in, I, I think it was the 10th of July. So what is the future yeah. step, what, it, what you were planning? So uh, it, interestingly, I'm not sure if it's actually legally enacted right now because the commission only put an English version of a PDF on their website. So oh, far, it's still not in the official journal of the European Union. So technically, as far as I'm concerned, this thing doesn't exist, even though everybody's using it, uh, because there's not even a French or German or whatever version of it yet. Uh, but but that being aside, um, as far as I heard, it should be published sooner or later now. Um, once it's there, um, there is, I think, three or four or five paths right now um, on, on how to challenge it. Uh, one of the challenge options comes out of Ireland. Another one, um, maybe some people in the call know there is a, a French lawmaker that uh, went for nomen at the general court that usually has a problem uh, a standing issue that that may uh, be challenging to actually overcome um, and then there's an option to go out of civil litigation um, into another reference um, so all of that means that there is let's say 10 judges that all make different decisions at different timelines um, so it's very hard to put an exact time on it um, because you know one one case suddenly moves very quickly another one a bit slower um, but we would expect that this hits the Court of Justice the latest in a year or so. And then typically the Court of Justice takes one and a half years, um, sometimes a bit shorter. Um, in this case, um, they already have 
kind of experience with all of that. So um, there is an option that they uh, may just continue um, with a bit of quicker decision so we could get a decision in two years if it's super quick. Another option that is on the table and that is interesting is that the um, the Treaty of the European Union also allows the Court of Justice um, in between the supplies a decision while they review it. That's more, if, you know, think of mergers and acquisitions. If the commission says this has to be split until there's a final decision, you don't split the company yet. Um, but that could also be applied to a other, this commission decision to say, given that we already know twice that it's a violation of the fundamental rights, given that there's not much change in the whole law, um, given that it's 500 million Europeans whose data gets transferred every day, we may disapply the decision in the meantime. So that could be an option. It's an option of probably 10% of the court actually really does that, but that could shorten the whole exercise to let's say a year or so. Um, mm. But we see what we're in is an endless ping pong game. It's basically striking down saying, oh, we have negotiations. Don't do anything yet. There's negotiations. Then there's two or three years of negotiations. Then there's one or two years of actually a thing. Then it's challenged and then we're back at square one. And if you look backwards, the interesting thing is the court of justice um, invalidation is actually ex, ex tunc, So it kind of invalidates the act backwards, which means mm -hmm. ever since 2000, we don't have a legal basis. And basically all the data was transferred to the US for the time is illegally transferred unless you have SECs or something that actually works in your specific sector. Um, and that um, can be interesting in another aspect that so far I think people don't have on their radar that much is this summer the European Collective Redress Directive got passed, which means you can do class actions. And, mm -hmm. and we now also have the first judgments on emotional damages. So if you say, okay, let's, I don't know, say it's a hundred bucks that all my data is now with the NSA um, at the lowest end, um, and you have 100 million people that think that's that's a nice, interesting case to have. Um, and if you do the math 100 times 100 million, you end up in spheres that are very different to any of the any of the like little, um, you know, minor fines compared to that that we have at the DPAs right now. So I think there is there's also going to be more, um, to be honest, more contentious or more um, aggressive enforcement at some point. Uh, because the system is also not working. I'm personally a fan that the regulators properly regulate that, that everybody knows what's going on and that we can move on. Um, but obviously if that path is getting closed up more and more and the regulators don't really do their job that well in many jurisdictions, depends on the country, um, people will go at our paths. And, um, and one obvious path is that I can tell you for ourselves, we had tons of law firms and whatever knocking on our door if we want to go down that route we usually take very conservative slow uh, you know low level approach to all of that but it is definitely something that is also um i think out there and and will be used at some point um be it by us or the consumer rights organizations and so on that, that will clearly scare a lot of people <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, i mean big tech aside uh, max I, i'm just wondering um because you know when legal i mean it was, i didn't actually realize but it was interesting to it's not actually properly enacted um but when your legal action starts um i heard that uh, you know the whole thing can be suspended which means you are not able to um, use that to do the safe data transfer so with all that going a big tech aside you know we're talking about clients of ours you know they are they, Thankfully, they're safe. But uh, you know, there are many businesses in the market who are wondering: Do we should we stay? Should we change? Should we, um, what mm -hmm. would be your advice? Given that uh, if it gets suspended, that means we don't have the legal um, framework to transfer. Uh, my personal, when I ask, when I'm asked by people, I think it's really. I mean, that but that's the thing for the last two or three years that we do an inventory of what is actually what do we have? Which data transfers do we have? What's easy to move? Where do I just basically take a Docker container and put it on another server, and I'm done with the problem? <laughs> um, you know, that's 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 the situations where, you know, I know that's not everything, but there's a lot of situations where that is an option. And, you know, software gets changed every couple of years. So when you change something, make it a priority to 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 get that headache out of your out of your system. Um, that is usually what I think right now you can do as an individual, because one important thing about all of that, fundamentally, this is a political problem. And it's neither for as a NGO that we can solve that, nor as a business, it's fundamentally a, a political conflict of law situation, where at some point you have to kind of choose which side of the law you're on. If you're like sticking with the American law, because that's the bigger risk for you. If you stick with the European law, because that's the bigger risk for you. That's 
or you split somehow your systems to say, okay, each one of them are compliant with some of it. And I want to add something. And again, I, I'm not a big fan of all of that, but the reality is if we have different democracies and we regulate internet all the time more and more, we will have different rules in different jurisdictions. Um, so running a globalized system will become more and more complicated and certain things will be very hard to overcome. My typical example out of the privacy bubble is freedom of speech, for example. We in Austria or Germany or France think that the denial of the Holocaust is a crime. Now you can legitimately say it's not, it's just freedom of speech. If someone has weird thinking about history, then <laughs> that's their problem. And that is the American thinking. And so as a company, for example, you will have these issues in so many different areas. Um, and I think the more we'll regulate online and, and you see the European use, Union pushing out a new law every, every year, basically, uh, but also the, Euro the Americans pushing out new regulations that at some point you will get into this conflict beyond just a privacy discussion. And I think, again, my ideal solution is that we come up with international agreements, that we can come up with certain rules around that. But my prediction would be that the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to have, you know, unclear waters where you kind of have to pick your sides maybe for, for certain operations, um, because it's going to be too hard to square all of them at the same time. Uh, luckily, we have the European Union and at least have some convergence within that market. Um, but already once you step outside and you're, I don't know, a lot of Austrian companies are in Russia and they now have a little bit of a problem on how to pull out of this now. <laughs> and, um, and that is that is risk of, of whenever you become international and, and, and uh, something that I would love to have a solution for, but I think no one really has that other than politics. And I think what we have to do is to push politicians to, to come up with solutions for that and not just, you know, pass another text that has a new headline and think that the problem goes away. <laughs> and talking about the new deal being almost identical to the old one. Uh, talking about like um, companies and people having to position themselves uh, in front of a, a complex problem. Uh, obviously, like we, we, like both Piano and Didomi are in the field of uh, of Martech uh, industry, so we, we work closely with uh, marketing professionals, analytic professionals, and and we try to to help them overcome the challenges that are caused by these uh, like uh, new regulations and uh, that are sometimes very uh, transformational. So they, they, their jobs are completely changing from one day to to the other. Uh, so it's also maybe a bit provocative, but. Uh, uh, Wanted to like go into this uh, this topic with you on, on on starting with like surveillance advertising and to frame that. I would say that uh, yeah, everyone has heard about the, the surveillance advertising complex. It's been like really uh, put in the media as uh, uh, something very scary out there that is uh, like harming and uh, seriously damaging our, our privacy. Uh, and so. As a result, when you're uh, working in the marketing or analytics space, uh, you seem to be constantly suspicious. So, uh, my first question for you, Max, is uh, to 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 your point: Is this the main threat for users' privacy these days? Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, let's let's start with that uh, to, to hear you on this on this one. Um, I don't, um, the main threat, I, I think privacy is highly personal and highly cultural also. So even within the EU, we have different cultures on what we think is private or not. Typically in Austria, anything financial is super private. You're not allowed to know what your friends are making or anybody else. Um, and then different cultures, like in the US, you brag about how much you're making or the other way around. We are very open if it comes to sexuality. My American friends, not that much. So <laughs> you, have, you have all these different dimensions. So I think I would not say that there is a main problem or claim that I have the authority to say what the main problem is. Um, I think that's that's highly personal on what you think the problem is, um, which means in that specific area, if you look at it like on a very high level, on a fun fundamental rights level, you usually say what's the public interest versus the interference with your right to privacy. Now, the public interest in advertisement is probably minimum compared to, you know, terrorism prevention or, you know, all the other public interests we usually have in these discussions. Really, yeah, advertisement. Pff, um, I know it's like a whole sector that, you know, whose main job this is, but is not like societally the biggest issue we have or the most, the most prominent issue. On the other hand, you have the right to privacy as a fundamental right. Um, and um, obviously the argument is usually that it's very tiny, the interference with, with the right to privacy. 
but that can also be different in specific situations. We had, for example, a year ago, a um, woman that was pregnant but lost her kid and then got advertisement over, your kid is now one year old, buy this shit, um, which in her situation was traumatizing. And I, she wanted to bring the case. I was like, please don't, because you're going to get re-traumatized with all of that. Um, so, you know, per, per situation, it's very different where you talk about a lot of the Cambridge Analytica, Trump advertisement, all of that is also run on the same system. So it's, it's I think, a bit more, more nuanced sometimes. Now putting my lawyer hat back on, <laughs> um, I think the, the bottom line of that is, is without consent, you can simply not do it. Um, the, the simple answer is going to be you will need consent for that. You will need to explain to people what the benefit is. Um, so I typical thing is to say, if you sign up to the newsletter, you're going to get a discount, you're going to get something wonderful. Um, I myself am signed up to certain newsletters because I think, oh, I, I want to know about, I don't know, the new deal that they have. Um, but I think it's, we have to, and in, in, in my personal view, um, the companies that, in, that onboard that and try not to see, you know, a, a confrontative approach to consumers to say, you have to now click on that, otherwise you can't even get in. Because, you know, if you go to a website and you want to buy shoes and the first thing you say you see is a yes or no other option banner, I, I'm not going to like that company. <laughs> That's my first instinct or that web shop. So I think the more that can become part of the user experience, as it's called, and, and put in a positive light or explain to people why there is a benefit for them, what's in it for them, then we may get a more, let's say, healthy transaction or a less confrontative situation, which I think... Is, is probably the way forward. That is typically where I see quite nice solutions and where people, you know, you also get probably the data of the people that are actually interested in the advertisement too, because, you know, what is it good for to have all the email addresses that are not reading the newsletter anyways? Um, so I think there is, is discussion to be had, but to be honest, I, I think Marie has much more information on how to do that and, 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 and what the numbers are on that. But I think from a purely legal pr point of view, we're probably not gonna get away from a consent model. And then the question is, how is that, how is that done in a way that it's not, you know, basically um, gone on your chest consent or, or, or fuck off? That's probably not in the long run uh, for most businesses. What, what will, I heard we heard about brand, but the appearance of a business in positive in any way would be my personal view on, on all of that. I hope that's somewhat useful. <laughs> Let's like uh, think together about like potential solutions. So, um, we, we've seen the, the ad tech industry uh, coming up with a, a standard called the Transparency and Consent Framework, trying to like be more transparent and give more control over the advertising experience to the end user. Uh, now, none of your business, if I'm correct, frame that as a cookie banner terror and uh, and issued also a lot of, uh, of complaints uh, over the years. Um, so obviously, like any standards, it has his uh, some merits, some flaws. Uh, I would like to hear you on like the, the transparency and consent framework, and, and maybe like if you think uh, it's more an issue of uh, making the standard better, or it's altogether mm. an issue in itself and uh, and can't be uh, can be solved through these kind of uh, like uh, uh, industry initiatives. Yeah, so I, um, I have to say we didn't do much on the TCF. So we basically re looked at cookie banners and how they are, are like. Um, and we basically went through the biggest provider and then would gradually go uh, through others um, over the next years. Um, and the main question for us was, um, I think the, the industry term is consent optimization, which the others call dark patterns. Um, and, um, and we went through also like the industry, like um, guidelines we found online or even training videos on how can you get even more people to click on the wrong button, so to say. Um, and that was, to be honest, partly quite revealing and quite entertaining. Um, and that is the main thing we looked into on, on that specifically. Uh, for the TCF, I can't really talk about that more. Johnny Ryan with the um, Irish Civil Liberty Union basically brought the cases in Belgium, and I just roughly know what's going on there. What we looked into more, and I think that's an interesting discussion to, to have, uh, which could be part of the e-privacy if it would ever pass, uh, would be a question of can we have something like a TCF, so an automated exchange between the browser and typically the consent management platform, which is not a cookie banner anymore. Um, thinking about like a user experience that is more useful. We have we had a suggestion for that just to show that this is doable, which was called 
um, automated data protection control ADPC. You can find it uh, with a with a um, test version and so on, on on the websites as well, which I think would, for example, be very useful because one of the biggest criticisms the general public has is the cookie banner. Everybody hates the cookie banner, um, and and to find a solution to have that transaction still ongoing because, as I said, you can give up your fundamental right to privacy. Um, but to implement that in a in a less disruptive way or in a way that um, is is easier for people to manage would be really interesting. But that would need kind of the last mile between the the, the browser and the server of the of the website or it's CMP. Um, that would be quite interesting. To be honest, from a privacy like from a user perspective. I don't really care about the TCF because that's the internal communication system between in a B2B fashion. Not really my concern as long as it works. Um, what's interesting for me is which interface do the users have and is it, is it an interface that is not disruptive for the website itself or for the users or, you know, having, you know, it's, it's nice to be transparent and it's granular, but, you know, we all know the pictures of the 500 little buttons that, that everybody just you know, laughs about. Um, so we need something more, more reasonable there. And I think that would be really interesting to have. Um, last sentence on that, um, there was this suggestion by Didier Reinders, the Justice Commissioner, to have a cookie pledge, like some self-regulation, whatever thing. Don't know, don't think that's going to go anywhere. But it would be interesting, for example, to have an industry move, um, especially with the browsers, to, to fix that problem somehow. Um, what I just hear is that most of the browsers don't want to deal with any of the privacy issues, and especially not national law like, or like local law like in the EU. Um, so it, we usually thought about a plugin or something that could do that. I hope that's somehow useful. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. I, I think there is a term to, to frame that, which is like fighting consent fatigue. I think in the cookie pledge, that's yeah. specifically like mentioned like, like that. Maybe for you, Marie, do you think uh, marketing and analytics professionals are aware of consent fatigue and of the impact it can have uh, yep. does it affect in some ways their analytics and uh, yeah what what uh, i mean i think about that i think roma you know leading your business um, you know as a consent management platform you you are helping businesses to you know create that uh, framework where people can easily understand what they're consenting to and obtaining consent uh, for the right reasons and based on value and i think that's very important and yet we do have a you know banner, cookie banner fatigue. Some people just randomly accept that. Well, some people just reject, reject, reject. Um, and advertising is a complex world. Um, in its consumers, I don't think they really understand what they are. Oftentimes, they don't understand what they're consenting to. Like myself, I just get, get really fatigued by all these banners. I just accept. And then I buy, a, I don't know, um, a, a crop top for my, for my daughter. And then I go to read a news news website in my, in my, in my office, and suddenly some boob tube advertising comes up on the right. It, that, that freaks you out. So then consumers start feeling, oh, I haven't given the consent. And they start getting sort of upset about the brands and you lose that brand, you know, affinity and, you know, trust and things like that. So I think it's very important. I mean, Roma, you, you know, Didom is doing an excellent job of bringing that so that consumers are clearly very easily identifying what I'm consenting to and giving the consent based on the relationship and the, the, the relationship brands built. I think that's, that's very important. And the other part is sort of, um, you know, there, there have been, you know, you know, big, you know, uh, things like, uh, you know, the, the fines on Meta and Cruteo and, and things like that. And I think it's very important for um, the brand to do that due diligence. I mean, I'm, it may sound, sound boring, but you need to document, you need to make sure, you know, who have who have consented, who haven't consented and having the user's rights um, observed and things like that. I think that's that's very important. But, but I think most important in advertising, this complex advertising world is um, make it really easy for people to understand what they're consenting to and respect their choice and permission-based marketing is a wonderful thing that is really powerful thing if you do it right absolutely and again on, on didomi's side we we like like any any user we we'd, we'd love to to see less uh cookie banners uh and uh but the truth is and i think max you you framed that correctly is that most of the what is possible is in the hand of uh, browsers and uh, operating systems, and so uh, until they uh, they come up with some sort of interface for uh, for end users to have a privacy agent running on their device, there is no real uh, solution to to consent fatigue. 
uh, and uh, I, would, I would even argue that uh, we will definitely need more standards if we want to go down the path of, uh, of privacy agents in the, in the future. And that's the next, uh, probably next uh, race, uh, uh, arm race that is uh, going to happen. Uh, which brings us to, I think, uh, uh, an inter interesting topic. There has been a lot of questions in the, in the, around the AI Act and uh, uh, the privacy uh, sandbox from Google. Uh, so, when when we we look at the at the privacy spectrum, um, there, there 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 is clearly like two sides. One one side being the on the on the left hand side. So all the things that organizations can do that uh, end users can control. And on there is a lot of of uh, initiatives going on on the right side, which are technological innovation around privacy. Um, and so. Uh, Max, as a, as a privacy professional, do you see that uh, privacy enhancing technologies could form some solutions to the, 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 the problems we are seeing? And yeah, do you think also uh, the, some of them are mature enough to be considered uh, from your experience and, and with your eyes uh, looking at the law in particular? Yeah, um, to be honest, I mean, in our litigation, we hardly see them in real life. Um, we do see some like, um, let's say, wannabe solutions, like, you know, the data was hashed, so we couldn't find it anymore. It's like, we all know that a hash is still personal data. But, you know, you, that's that's as far as you see privacy enhancing technology in our real life cases that people bring on our desks and complain about. Um, but obviously, that's probably also the ones that you know, didn't really do much, so we may have a negative selection here. Um, but uh, I think generally it's it's the way to go. The really interesting thing is also when, I mean, Noib itself designed software and, and built system that we need for our uh, work and, and, you know, for engaging with, with hundreds and ten thousands of people, um, is how do you do that in, in a way that it's well designed? And um, what I see there is the biggest issue still is, is to a large extent an educational um, issue in the sense of like, Find a programmer that really understands this in detail. Find a lawyer that understands the technicalities in detail, because the average lawyer is very impressed when they hear, "Oh, it's encrypted." But then you have to ask, "What type of encryption? Where is the key?" <laughs> you know, and and so we see that there is still a lot of that exchange missing, maybe. And I think in the long run, we would need, um, you know, lawyer technologist mixes that can actually do that somehow well, because um, it's really hard as a lawyer to to manage a topic that you don't fully understand on the factual side of it. Um, and I think we still have that to a large extent. So um, I'm, I'm always impressed if people work in that direction and, and if there are solutions that are, that are really worthwhile. Um, I have to say half of the solutions I see are sometimes more a sales pitch than, than really <laughs> delivering on, on what they promise. If you, you know, once you go one or two layers deeper, um, you then oftentimes hear, ah, actually not. Um, but I think that's kind of the the the, um, the world we're in, and where this whole bubble has to mature a lot. I think we also need to um, recognize that we're in like a, a huge revolution. If you think about the industrial revolution, like going on for 200 years, we're very much in the baby infant steps, and we're all probably going to look back at the conversations we have now, 10 years down the road, and think, oh my God, how how could we not have seen this? But that's how how stuff like that develops, and I think. Um, it, it's a very interesting path, but I don't see the magic tricks that far um, that, that can solve stuff easily, but that's, you know, maybe just because we're not there yet and, and we're on, on the way there. I think that is generally what I would, in our practice, what we see with that. Marie, on your side, do you also see that as transforming the way you're, uh, you're building technology at, at Piano and uh, for, for your clients? Uh, do you see that as a as a the way to go as well for technology providers? I I do uh, to a certain degree. I, I like this slide. You know what organizational measures and technological advancements we're getting, and we've seen. You know it, this was not long ago when Google. You know tried to do flock and it's just flopped um, and there were many reasons for it and there was no consultation you know proper consultation process you need to involve all the right people to make it beneficial for everybody so first i think this is a, a solution for 
marketers who need to go out and you know find new customers and um, you know, turn those customers into loyal customers and things. I think that this this the technological enhancement advancement is a is a solution for that. Um, and rather than like federated analytics, etc., I, I personally prefer, as you say, on the right hand side, as an organization, you own the data, you collect your first party data permission-based, um, even better, and um, you own that data. And when you do that, and because you've got the permission, you can go into, for example, clean rooms where you are not actually selling or transferring your data. You still own the data in your own safe environment and being able to exchange and target uh, based on, on the permission. I think that's, that's for me, that's that's the right, um, right way to go. But uh, I think it's a, a good solution for marketers. Um, the next part is, is it a good solution for users? I think we need to be very mindful, respectful uh, of uh, of the users. That's why, you know, sort of consent and consent mechanism and doing the right thing, as, you, as we discussed earlier, is very important. Thank you. That could be a good conclusion. So let's make sure that uh, whatever is built and users understand how it works and therefore trust it. I think that's uh, very, very often overlooked by uh, technologists. Um, we are already at time. So maybe like a, a last question uh, for you, Max. What's next for you? Uh, do you have like uh, uh, things uh, that are coming soon that you could share with, with us? Um, yeah, I mean, we're basically working in three directions, um, as I usually explain it. The one thing is kind of standard setting cases, so situations where the law is unclear and we just need a determination by the EDB or the Court of Justice to say A or B. Um, that is always one thing that we've worked on for a long time. Uh, what we do more is what we call mass complaints, which is kind of the, the cookie banner thing that we started, where we automate a lot of that um, enforcement. Um, we usually do that in a very kind of business friendly version. So it's literally serve it on a silver plate, like people, the businesses get an email with like the envisioned complaint that in two months would be filed unless you, and we even in the one cookie banner um, software that we actually targeted first because it was the biggest one was OneTrust as I think generally known. Um, and we even had like a, a screenshots of how you can change the settings to be privacy compliant. So it literally was an effort of five minutes to do that if you're a DPO. Um, so, and only if that's not doable, then we actually uh, continue with, with actually filing cases. That was very efficient. Uh, we had um, in the first round, just with the first email, more than 40% compliance rate and a huge spillover. So we had about 5,000 websites in our database. Uh, we only sent emails to about 500 or wrote complaints for about 500. But what we saw in the second round is that a vast majority of the others suddenly switched because word got around that there is now something going on and suddenly all the banners had a reject button that they didn't have before and realized that over the summer, suddenly that happened without us even you know, directly engaging. So that was really interesting. And the third one that I already mentioned, what's really gonna be interesting is collective redress as well, which I think is especially interesting for the very big ones. Um, I mean, obviously collective redress becomes relevant if you're one of the really big shots um, and that will probably be um, a bit of a new arena of, of this privacy debate as well. Um, if you're, you know, let's say a big shot nationally, that could be a thing. And obviously if you're an international company, that's that's quite interesting as well, um, how, how that works out. And it may even in, in the American bubble trigger a bit more the, uh, the anxiety because the word class action is known in the US um, versus the word GDPR not that much known. <laughs> um, so that could, could also, um, let's say, move things a bit Thank, thanks a lot, Max. Um, Marie, what's next for, for Piano? Uh... Oh, lots, lots. Um, in terms of privacy, and as I mentioned, uh, Piano has been leading the charge in terms of data privacy. It's, this predates even you know, 2018 GDPR, adoption of the GDPR. So we will continue. So when we say we're privacy by design, et cetera, we, we're not serving lip service. We're really serious about it. Um, and we are on a mission to create that ethical analytics where our brands, our clients, their brands are safe, um, protected. They are able to collect the data in a safe environment and, and creating that competitive um, advantage. But we're also working. Another exciting thing is, um, you know, there's a GDPR, European wide GDPR certificate. So we've applied for that and it's about to come out. So it's all of this sort of um, official seal of approval. We will have loads of certificates under our belt, but it's not just about certificate. We're really, really serious about practicing, advising our clients to do the right thing. 
do the right thing. I think that will form the conclusion of uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, thanks a lot for attending this discussion. Uh, obviously, we'd be happy to continue this uh, discussion. So please get in touch with uh, Marie, uh, Max, and I, and our teams if you'd like. Uh, obviously, the webinar will be uh, also available on the replay, as well as many other resources on our respective uh, blogs and websites. Uh, so, Max, Marie, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, many thanks on behalf of uh, uh, everyone, and uh, I'll, I'll see you, uh, hopefully, uh, in a while to rediscuss all these passion passionate topics. Would love that. Thank you very much, Mom, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.